Ambassador Tanvi Zainab, thank you so much for speaking to SNI. Now, when we talk about the External Affairs Minister giving her speech at the plenary of the OIC, yes, is it just seen as a setback for Pakistan, or considering the history, 50 years later, when you were evicted 50 in 1969, yes, now you have the External Affairs Minister speaking yes. at the plenary, speaking as the guest of honor, and the Pakistani minister is in there. Yeah. <laughs> So I see it as a correction of a historic wrong. We should not have been evicted from Rabat in 1969. So this is a correction. Its full implications are still not clear. We were invited as a guest of honor. Obviously, UAE could not have invited us without the full knowledge and approval of Saudi Arabia. So obviously, again, there is a consensus among the important countries of the uh, I mean, of this organization, that India should be brought back into the mainstream. But we have some way to go. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we don't have an invitation relating to our observer status or, to, or with full regard membership. to the full membership. Uh, Pakistan is very seriously opposed to seeing India in the councils of the OIC. They believe this is their exclusive preserve. This is the only platform, indeed, they have where they can issue all those one-sided one resolutions. So they are going to oppose it. It's not clear which way things will go in future. We have to wait and see. A historical wrong being righted, you're saying, uh, but the fortuitous date when it comes is when there's a lot of tension between India and Pakistan, uh, yes. the Balakot yes. court strikes, yes. uh, them retaliating, the dog fight, etc. The timing was fortuitous to a certain extent. You see, there is a very peculiar dichotomy in regard to the OIC. That on the one hand, Pakistan gets to issue all those resolutions against India, blaming India for something in Kashmir, with regard to abuses of the Indian Muslim community, with regard to the destruction of Babri Masjid, etc. But never mentions its own role in regard to uh, supporting extremism and violence. Obviously, they would not do that. But the rest of the membership knows about it. It's not a secret. It's there in all the literature available in the world. And therefore, Pakistan keeps on issuing all these resolutions on the one hand, but they are totally meaningless. They have no relation with reality. So, yes, I think when we had this event, there was indeed one more confirmation of what Pakistan is doing. Uh, they, after all, 40 people were killed in India. It is also true that Jaish and Muhammad took credit for this, quote-unquote credit. They have perpetrated violence earlier as well. Uh, they are a known jihadi group and they are known to enjoy the sponsorship of the Pakistan armed forces. So where is Pakistan going to go? I mean, why is India being blamed? You ask, as far as their narrative is concerned, it begins with the bombing at Balakot. But that's not the beginning of the narrative. The beginning of the narrative is something that happened on 14th February. So that everyone in the auditorium knew this. Everyone at the plenary knew. Which is why she was so well received and so warmly received. Uh, the invitation us. letter itself talked about uh, the yeah. worldwide high-profile nature <laughs> of uh, India. Yeah. When there were two or three points made in the invitation. Uh, one was that it was a tribute to India's status, its role in international affairs, and the fact that it had contributed significant to the Islamic civilization. All three are extremely important, very relevant uh, factors. And I think this is being recognized. It's not, I think it's being recognized for a long time in terms of our bilateral relationship. We have been close to the Gulf countries uh, politically for at least 18, 19 years. They have engaged very strongly with us. And to that extent, their ties with the Pakistanis have been much more marginalized compared to us. We bring strength to the table. We bring value to the table, you know, economically, in terms of energy, in terms of investment, in terms of market, and of course, politically as well. When, when you're talking about uh, the implications, what are the implications for Pakistan, considering the circumstances? They wanted the, the invitation to be resigned. It wasn't. Uh, the foreign minister had to skip the plenary itself. Absolutely. So is it more than a slap on the wrist diplomatically? I think if you were sensitive in Islamabad, you would understand the message you were being given. 
But who said those guys are sensitive? <laughs> you know, they are hard-boiled, brazen characters. They don't care. They have an agenda. This is an agenda that wasn't invented today. It was invented in 1989, that's 30 years ago. They adopted the sponsorship of jihad as state policy, as an instrument of state action against India. And since then, in these 30 years, the organizations that they have sponsored have gone well beyond Kashmir, they've gone into the rest of India, but they have become centers for training for international terrorists. lashkar e tayyaba has very often been associated by, 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 with the training of lone wolf characters. And it doesn't do only training. It first indoctrinates people so that he's a jihadi for life. So we have a serious problem in Pakistan. We have a civilian government that gets elected and it enjoys majority support at a certain period. They reach out their hand of friendship and dialogue with India. We've had, we've had dialogue with them from consistently with Benazir Bhutto, with Nawaz Sharif, uh, and with uh, now Imran says, I talk to me. My problem is, what do I get from talking to him? He doesn't bring any value to the table. He doesn't control the Kashmir file or so the terrorism. It seems that to, just getting India to talk is a victory in itself, not the outcome. But you know, it's a waste of my time. Ambassador, the history of the resolutions that Pakistan uh, gets passed at the OIC, if you can put that in context now, in terms of the organization itself, yes. it does not need to be voted on. Anybody can put up any resolution. It's, it's treated with contempt. Let's go back a little bit. How did this organization come into being? As the 50s dawned, you had a deep divide within the Arab world. You had these emerging revolutionary regimes, Nasser, uh, and then Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Syria, Sudan, all of them became revolutionary republics. And opposing them, Saudi. you had the traditional monarchies led by Saudi Arabia. So you had a doctrinal divide because they were affiliated with the Islamic side and these were secular, nationalistic and socialist. But you also had a divide in terms of the Cold War. The traditional monarchies had affiliated themselves with the Western Alliance and many of the republics were affiliated with the Soviet Alliance. So you had that divide as well. The Western Alliance saw Islam, the faith and Muslims, the people, as their natural allies. Now, the, initially, it appeared as if the republics were winning. Uh, I mean, as far as they were concerned, they were one, one revolution after another. And Saudi Arabia had every reason to be deeply concerned about their influence. But then the 67 uh, war ended all that. So this was a forum where the Saudis yeah. could... Saudis then control. created the forum. Saudis went Islamic. They mobilized their, their leadership of the Muslim world on the platform of the OIC. And that is how you find the shift away from the republics in favor of the monarchy. So Saudi Arabia controls the OIC. It uses the OIC to pass you know, resolutions supportive of its own interests, as specific as that. In return, it allows every member freely to issue resolutions against non-members. You can't issue resolutions against members without debate because they are there. But you can issue resolutions against non-members. So this is the background. And it has worked for Saudi Arabia in terms of showing or projecting its leadership of the Islamic world. It gets all the resolutions that it wants. It has got resolutions against Iran in terms of the challenge that Iranian pilgrims had posed in 1987. And Iran was at that time confronting the Saudis in 1988. It got resolutions in favor of the Iraqis against the Iranians during the Iran-Iraq war, but against Iraq after the Iraqis occupied Kuwait. So it has consist, and now in recent times it has got resolutions supporting its own posture in yeah. Syria and in Yemen. So this is the background. To, in return, to that extent, yes. how important is it? It's coming straight after the Crown Prince's visit to both India and Pakistan. Yes. And since you're saying that they control the OIC, or that's Absolutely. the forum was created yes. for that that Sushma Swaraj is invited. Yes, it has not come in the public domain, but it makes sense to me that MBS, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, values his ties with India 
more than in any way compared. It's, it's much more valuable compared to anything the kingdom would have with regard to Pakistan. But I want to have a reality check here. Saudi Arabia's relationship with Pakistan is fundamentally different from its relationship with India. It's with a client India, state. Pakistan is a client state. Exactly. Like Saudi Even, I don't want to use a crude, harsh word. I wrote an article where I said that Pakistan accepted that it is the foot soldier of the Saudi interest. Uh, yeah, Pakistani see, soldiers in Saudi yeah, Arabia. So, they, so called Pakistan has made its armed forces available for the security of the kingdom in the past. There was a long period when the soldiers had been expelled. From 68 to 88, they were there. Then they were expelled. They came back sometime uh, 10, 12 years ago. And now General uh, Rahil Sharif heads you know, the But force. Rahil Sharif is a bit of a joke, with all honesty. Because he's a general without an army. He's just sitting there in Riyadh, supposedly heading something called the Sunni NATO. There's nothing Sunni about it and certainly not a NATO. There is no army. But they needed him as a symbolic figure. They didn't want, they wanted to show that they enjoy support beyond the Arab world. So they had this uh, general who was retiring and who was supposed to have fought counter-terrorism operations, which I find weird. Uh, and as a result, they brought him. Uh, initially, they announced his appointment without the approval of the Pak government. So it's a bit of a joke. I don't take that seriously because you are competing now with Turkey, which is a very major Sunni state. You are, uh, you are besieging Qatar, which is your GCC member and a Sunni state. And the best friend of the Qataris are the Iranians, which is supposed to be a Shia state. So this is all nonsense. This sectarian divide is absolute nonsense. But the Pakistanis, now there are rumors that there is a battalion in Saudi Arabia protecting the border uh, for, from the Houthis. There was a fear at one time that the Houthis might come across uh, the border into and threaten uh, uh, Saudi presence there. So there's a Pakistani battalion. But there are also suggestions that there might in fact even be a brigade. We don't know. Uh, they are available there. But, South, the, um, the, uh, but the Pakistanis had made clear, and I think that position has not changed, that they will not fight the Houthis in Yemen. They don't want to get involved in a sectarian dispute. This was the position of Nawaz Sharif. <laughs> what is the position of Imran Khan? You know, every time I think of Mr. Imran Khan, I can't, I, I can't take it seriously. Because he's a creature of the armed forces. The armed forces were fed up with the, with the Zardaris and the Nawaz Sharifs of their country and brought in a new man. And they put him and planted him there and I'm supposed to believe he's a prime minister. And uh, he brings no value or strength to that office. You, you talked about how much value India can bring to the OIC. Yes. You, the history that you're talking about, 1969 you were evicted. There was a long period of time there was no interaction. 90s, soon after yes. a militancy, uh, surfaced in Kashmir is when the Pakistanis started using that forum to uh, with their resolutions against Kashmir Absolutely. and various other yes. agencies. You've also in the past mentioned how Jaswant Singh then said that all these resolutions are not even worth the paper that they were written on. Yes, yes. And so what, if India brings value to the OIC, what value does India get from the OIC? Yes. Don't we pride ourselves on a secular country? We Absolutely are not correct. Uh, it's not predicated on the fact that yeah. we have a large Muslim population, the second largest in the world. <coughs> the relationship that India can have with the OIC has to be linked with something very significant happening. And that is the, a new beginning. If the OIC reinvents itself into a serious global forum, bringing together major countries of Asia and Africa, and a few from Europe and even one from Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, it is an organization worth taking seriously. If it continues as it is today, then it doesn't bring any value at all. Now, if it is changing, if it is evolving, then I see value for India. Number one, all the member countries of the OIC, except Pakistan, have very close bilateral ties. So it makes sense for India to be sitting at a platform where it is already welcome and has close ties. India has uh, trade relations of $230 billion with them collectively, as uh, Madam Swaraj uh, mentioned in her speech. 
uh, we have very, very substantial ties and we value them. So it is one more platform where you can engage with other countries and see how you can benefit each other. That would be my first point. But we all have bilateral ties yes. with all bilateral these countries. Bilateral ties except. is not always enough. I mean, you may have bilateral ties, but very often membership of an organization that is vibrant. Sure. You know, that, that generates a value beyond the bilateral. It's like BRICS. We have relations with all the countries of BRICS, but when you collectively come together at the BRICS platform, there is a certain resonance that you would not have had bilaterally. Similarly, with regard to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, very close to Russia and China and the Central Asian Republic. But when you sit together and you concentrate your minds on issues that matter, and you can start having ideas, you do build up relationships. For example, we may have certain differences with the Chinese, but when we sit with them at the STO and BRICS, there's a, there's a very different resonance to the relationship. I see something similar. Do you happening. visualize that happening with the OIC? Changing, re-energizing, this, re this is the key. Being vibrant organization. Now, I have, would argue to you that the invitation to India has two values, two separate values. Number one, it marks a new beginning for India. But it also suggests a new beginning for the OIC because if it was business as usual, Why they need not have called India at all. You know, India was not, uh, India has had very substantial ties with these countries for a very long time. So obviously there is a signal being given to us. You have a young leader in Saudi Arabia who's talking the language of reform. You have a very vibrant leader in Abu Dhabi, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, who is talking primarily of technology on the one hand and moderation and harmony on the other. We resonate very closely with both these countries separately. Uh, we are looking at joint projects with them. So I think that they have, would have also discussed ties with India. So there is a hint, a suggestion at this point that there could be a new beginning. If there is a new beginning, then I favor very strong ties that India might have. But absent that, if it is business as usual, you see, why am I further encouraged? I see that India is talking the language of the future. We talk about technology, of telecommunications, of space, of giving aspirations to young people, of economic development, social justice, a new world order, equitable order, all of these. This is the language of the future. These are the challenges of the future. What, what does Pakistan bring to the table? Plebiscite, UN resolutions, uh, third party mediation, Muslims abuse. No, this has nothing to do with what actually resonates at the OIC. It's, it's very, very fatigued discourse. A discourse that is done with no feeling, with no rapture. It's all with about emotion. something that's happened 70 years ago. Can you imagine anybody today seriously ta talking of UN resolutions, uh, you know, or uh, a mediation? or a third, third party mediation or, or something like that. So, Master, how does the organization work if you have to move to the next step, which is either observer or mem yes. full membership? I think the... Uh, because be Pakistan will oppose it yeah. tooth and nail. I think, yes, Pakistan may oppose it, but if Saudi Arabia decides that enough is enough and that we are bound on a new path, then that can change. As you know, the positions that Saudi, that Pakistan projects on Kashmir and on India in the resolutions is not shared by a single member country in terms of their national posture, including Saudi Arabia. You, you know that from personal experience. From personal experience. I was there. Saudi Arabia read out their position on Kashmir to our minister in 2001. That takes you back 18 years. And they have remained consistent. This is a point to emphasize that they said that we have ties with Pakistan, we have ties with India. We will not look at India through the prism of our relations with any other country. And they have stuck to that. It is very often I joke during the recent visit that it is we, uh, Indian media, who are not, uh, I mean, you know, respecting this divide. Why should you grudge another country? I, I told a journalist on the phone that do we not have ties with Iran even as we are welcoming the Saudi crown prince? Has the Saudi crown prince complained about it? 
has he looked at any of the joint statement we will conclude what about our uh, taking over gwadar i mean taking over Chabahar. chabahar and putting all those projects has the saudi said anything about it we've got very substantial ties with the iranians and yet we look at every line and phrase as oh he said this in terms of substance let's be very objective the substantial saudi relationship is with india it's as clear as that the crown prince knows it how he steers this forward remains to be seen i would say and i'm going to speak very frankly in this regard that you be really need peace and security in west asia this conflict scenario which has now continued for 8 or 9 8 years from the arab spring onwards is a serious distortion and it prevents us from thinking constructively about the future when you expect a war to take place tomorrow after all we've had this conflict in syria half a million people dead all the cities destroyed several million people refugees how can you think constructively saudi arabia has serious concerns relating to iran and iran has very serious concerns relating to the kingdom i think and i have advocated as you know very strongly that india should structure and lead a peace process no one else is doing it we are the one country that can actually deliver at least let us try the op- the possibility of failure is there but nothing prevents you from making an effort we are already 8 years late but i feel the possibility of the region thinking new thoughts looking at new arrangements working together in ways not possible today becomes a reality if we have peace in the region and that is where india's central role has to be looked at and i understand one of the things that the saudis are very interested in as reflected in the joint statement is maritime security we never thought of that now this is something that resonates very strongly in delhi if we work together indian ocean belongs to all but it doesn't need to be a zone of conflict and competition we can work with these major countries uh in regard to maritime security we haven't done that before we have not even talked to them about this uh, we are also concerned about extremism and violence this is a concern that everybody shares in fact if i was sitting in islamabad i would be deeply concerned because pakistan as a nation has been ruined has been destroyed because of their armed forces affiliation with these wretched extremists who are totally lawless respect no borders and respect no values islamic or otherwise so these are very serious dangers we can engage with imran khan once we see him as the real prime minister of his country rather than a lackey of these armed forces abbas ahmed thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us thank, thank you. you sir wish you Thanks. all the best